Welcome. In this slide presentation, we'll go over ship safety and emergency response. The unique situation on board a vessel is that the crew has to be the emergency response team. If there's an emergency, we can't just walk off the vessel and wait for the emergency responders to arrive. Being isolated out in the water, sometimes miles from land, means that we have to be prepared to be the first responders. Even in cases where we are close enough to call for shoreside help, we will still be the first ones to deal with the emergency and work with outside help to minimize harm. Some of the slides will not be accompanied by narration, since in such cases, I believe the slide says enough, and you don't need my raspy voice spoiling the ambiance, so click through to pace that suits you. The best way to combat an emergency is to prevent it by keeping ship shape. A well-kept ship is not just a thing of beauty, but also a good representation of the crew's skill. It is a more functional, comfortable, and safe ship. The two main tenets of keeping ship shape are proper stowage and proper maintenance. If you maintain order to where things go, you'll know where to find them in a pinch. You won't lose useful items and they won't end up in places they don't belong. For many of the items on board, especially those items necessary for emergency response, we are required by the Coast Guard to maintain in good working order. Machinery and safety equipment should always be kept in good working order regardless of the frequency of use. Especially with safety equipment, we hope that we never have the need to use it, but in case we do, we want it to work and work well. Proper maintenance will minimize the risk of power loss, flooding, and fire. For non-emergency equipment, it's good to practice good maintenance since there's the possibility poorly maintained equipment can be what leads to an emergency. Proper maintenance will help you if you have an emergency and have to depend on your equipment to resolve the situation. Any emergency on board will most likely be one or a combination of those listed. On board inland seas, we conduct regular drills that address such emergencies. With each emergency, each crew member has a specific set of responsibilities. These responsibilities and to whom they're assigned are listed on the station bill, which is posted in specific locations throughout the vessel. The station bill is a good reminder and should be consulted regularly. Any assumptions or ambiguity surrounding responsibilities should be brought to discussion whenever encountered. However, even though the station bill is constantly visible on board, the time of the alarm is not when the station bill should be consulted. That is the time to be carrying out the responsibilities. It is the crew member's responsibility to memorize their duties and make sure they are clear on their assigned responsibilities. While not dismissing the possibility of a fire in other areas of the ship, it's important to note that there are some areas on board that are more prone than others. Lithium ion batteries are very common in electronic devices such as cell phones and laptops. With the increasing presence of lithium-ion batteries, there is a need to acknowledge the potential risk. This risk of failure is quite low. It rarely happens, but when it does, failure is catastrophic, resulting in a fire potentially reaching 1000 degrees Fahrenheit 
and cannot be extinguished with any of the standard extinguishers that are kept on board. Due to the type of risk, that is why lithium ion batteries shall not be charged on board while unattended or shall be charged in the designated charging station. The fire tetrahedron is the diagram used to describe the basic components of a fire. A fire is a chemical reaction between three primary components, heat, oxygen, and fuel. The way to extinguish a fire is to interrupt this relationship. There are three ways a fire can spread to other areas of the ship. This is important to know for the purpose of setting boundaries in order to isolate the fire, as well as for overhauling the site to ensure the fire is completely extinguished. When overhauling the site, panels need to be removed, inaccessible areas need to be opened, and all the possible routes the fire could have traveled need to be chased in order to be sure it hasn't spread to other areas. This can involve demolition of bulkheads, cabinets, bunks, etc. The way fire spreads is through Radiation. Heat radiates to adjacent objects or areas. An example of radiation is when you stand next to a hot stove and feel the heat coming off of it. Convection. Air currents circulate heat and fire through openings to other areas. Can also carry embers and hot gases with the airflow caused by the wind or even created internally by the fire itself. Conduction. Metal rods or pipes transfer heat to other areas. Anything that is a good conductor of electricity is also a good conductor of heat. For this reason, it's a good idea to follow the heat in anything metal. Knowing what types of fire you're dealing with will help determine the plan of attack and which extinguisher is best to use, or rather best not to use. A Class A fire is made up of common solid combustible materials such as wood, cloth, paper, and rubber combustible solids in general. A campfire is a perfect example of a Class A fire. A Class B fire is made up of flammable liquids such as fuel, grease, and oil. These are difficult because they can spread with the flow of the liquid. Some items that are solid in their normal state can become a Class B when burning. Think of wax or even some plastics. A Class C fire is a fire that involves energized electrical equipment, conductors, and appliances. Class C not only poses a shock hazard, but also can keep flaring up as long as the power is still available. A Class D fire is a fire that involves combustible metals such as sodium, magnesium, potassium, or titanium. On most vessels, flares and lithium-ion batteries are the primary source of this class of fire. What makes these fires tricky is that the burning material generates its own oxygen and an incredible amount of heat. It takes a special extinguishing agent that extinguishes a Class D fire by interrupting the chemical reaction. Contained inside your common extinguishers, there are several types of extinguishing agents. Water is good for Class A fires, such as wood, paper, or rags, but it's not good for liquid, since water can disperse the liquid, increase surface area, therefore causing the fire to flare up. Powder is good for all types, with the exception of Class D, which takes a special agent. It is a jack of all trades, even though solid is not listed in this chart, it is still effective on Class A fires.
The limitation of dry chem to consider is that it interrupts the fire's chemical reaction, but does not do a good job at removing the heat. It's important to know regarding being vigilant during a reflash watch once the fire is extinguished. Foam is good for Class B fires since it is low density, therefore has less of a scattering effect, and it floats on the surface, smothering the fire. CO2 is good for A, B, and C fires and works by displacing the oxygen. However, CO2 has some drawbacks to consider. Similar to dry chem, CO2 also does not remove heat and therefore poses a greater possibility of having a reflash. More importantly, CO2 works by displacing the oxygen feeding the fire. If used in a confined space, there is the risk of suffocating anybody within that space. In the event of an actual fire aboard inland seas, grab the nearest handheld extinguisher. Don't worry about whether or not it's an A, B, or C rated extinguisher. The right type of extinguisher has been placed throughout the vessel in locations near to where a specific type of fire could occur. For example, near the electrical panel, you'll find a halon substitute extinguisher that is effective at extinguishing the fire, yet does not do any harm to the surrounding electrical components. Also, most of the extinguishers on board inland seas are dry chem that are suitable for A, B, and C type fires. They will work on virtually all the fires with the exception of a Class D fire. And with the Class D fire, lithium ion batteries, or flares, the most effective extinguisher is the water the vessel is floating in. Our best option is to jettison the burning object. Please note the location of the ring pull pin. This is standard on any handheld extinguisher I've ever encountered. An important anecdote to remember in case you ever have to use an extinguisher. There was a fire on board a vessel in a shipyard that was caused by some welding work. One of the workers, understandably in a frantic, grabbed an extinguisher and rushed to attack the fire. When he attempted to pull the pin, securing the trigger handle, it wouldn't come out. Therefore, the extinguisher could not be expelled to put out the fire. The fire was eventually extinguished before any major damage was incurred, and more importantly, anyone got hurt. Upon later investigation, the extinguisher was found to be in perfect working order. It was determined that the adrenaline of the person who grabbed the extinguisher caused them to squeeze the handle tight enough to bind the pin and prevent it from coming out. If there were to be a fire on board, we're probably not going to be super calm. Even if we keep most of our composure, there is most likely going to be a feeling of excitement. So it's good to have this story in the back of your mind in case you are ever the one needing to use the fire extinguisher. The fixed extinguishing system on board Inland Seas is fastened to the overhead on the port side of the engine compartment as seen in the photo to the left. It has a spray head similar to those seen in commercial buildings that triggers when the temperature in the protected area reaches that of an open flame. It can also be triggered manually, outside of the compartment by a pole handle shown in the picture on the right. Our pole handle is located on the exterior port side of the pilot house and has a ring securing the pole similar to that of a handheld fire extinguisher. It is only pulled under the captain's orders. You can read the slide on your own but I would like to speak on the topic of boundary cooling. Water is extremely effective at removing heat. Therefore, no matter what type of fire, it can be very useful in preventing the fire from spreading by hosing down surfaces above and around the burning area in order to keep their temperature below the point of combustion. However, keep in mind, you'll have a problem if you pump too much water into the boat. If the boat sinks, the fire will assuredly be extinguished, but that would be a Pyrrhic victory. This would be the ideal response to a fire on board. Sound the alarm if fire is suspected. The alarm can be sounded by anyone suspecting the fire by shouting, Fire in the engine room! or Fire in the galley! 
or wherever else the fire is located. The sooner the rest of the crew can help, the better the chances. If it turns out to be a false alarm, mark it up as a good drill exercise. When the alarm is given, all passengers and non-essential staff should clear out from down below. The next step is to attack the fire, keep it from growing. And the best way to do this is with the use of an extinguisher. Anyone on site at the fire can use the extinguisher if compelled to do so, even if they are not tasked with that responsibility on the station bill. Especially with fires inside a skillet or other types of cookware, or even in a wastebasket, you can smother the fire with a fire blanket, a lid, or any other item that can cover the fire. If possible, without high risk to anybody on board, jettison the burning fuel over the side of the vessel. While attacking the fire, we also want to isolate the fire. We need to close hatches, vents, and other paths of convection. We need to do boundary cooling with water, minimize conduction and heat radiation. As well, clear away any potential fuel source. The final stage of the operation is to establish a reflash watch. Once the fire is under control, stand by with an extinguisher to pre prevent reflash. Look for hidden embers or smoldering remnants. Perform demolition if necessary. Overhaul the fire area. Keep in mind the three ways in which fire spreads. Radiation, convection, and conduction. Pictured here are some of the mechanical and electrical means of dewatering the vessel. The engine driven pump, which you see in the top left photo, is run off the main engine via a belt to an electronically activated pulley. It is plumbed into a manifold, which you see in the bottom left photo, with valves in order to isolate the dewatering of each compartment in the ship. In the photo on the right, you can see an example of the 12 volt electric bilge pumps that we have in every compartment that is set to activate automatically if there is a significant amount of water present. If the engine is down and the batteries are dead, we also have a variety of manual pumps at our disposal. Even some of the five gallon buckets on board used for other purposes can be employed for dewatering the ship.
Preparing to abandon ship. We may prepare to abandon ship, having everything completely ready, but never have to leave the ship. An emergency that would pose the possibility of abandoning ship would be preceded by another dangerous event. Fire. Collision, for example, with something, oh, I don't know, an iceberg. Heavy weather. Or flooding. By preparing to abandon ship, personnel are putting on PFDs, sending distress calls, and preparing life rafts, gathering gear, water, food, blankets, and anything else that may be of assistance in a life raft. By calling to prepare to abandon ship, it does not mean we are jumping over the side or leaving the vessel immediately. Even though it's good to stay with the vessel for as long as possible, for reasons stated in the previous slide, we just want to make sure we don't stay aboard too long. I've heard it preached by senior officers in the past that you should stay with the vessel until you have to climb up into the life raft. I disagree. When a ship is sinking, she becomes unstable due to the water sloshing around inside the ship and therefore becomes a difficult plaf platform to keep your footing. Add to that, especially on a sailing vessel, all of the rigging that will be swinging around as the ship rolls to extreme angles. Things will start to come loose, break under strain, and become dangerous. Add to that, it will be impossible to coordinate an orderly life raft embarkation if you're all having to climb up into the life raft from a vessel disappearing beneath the waves. The life raft should be embarked upon when it can still be done so orderly at the time the situation aboard has deteriorated to the point where it is becoming unsafe to remain aboard. The vessel in the photo is of the bounty that sank in 2012 during Hurricane Sandy. One of the conclusions of the investigation that followed was that the crew waited too long to abandon ship, notice the damaged rigging, broken spars, and other debris awash. The instructions you see on this slide are posted on placards next to the ship's radio in the pilot house and inside the aft cabin. It's good to be familiar with the variety of distress signals not only for our sake but for the sake of identifying another person or vessel in distress. That way we may be able to render assistance. We have a variety of signal flares kept in a yellow container in the wheel box aft of the ship's helm. The name EPIRB stands for Emergency Position Indicating Radio Beacon. Our EPIRB is located on the gallows board above the rescue boat. It can manually or automatically send a distress signal from anywhere on the globe. We test it monthly and record the test in the radio log. As seen in the top photo, our life raft is in the big white barrel on the port side of the foredeck. It has a capacity of 50 persons and gets inspected once a year at a licensed inspection facility. The bottom photo is when it was in inflated for inspection in 2017. The top left photo is one of two emergency knives packed with the raft. The top right photo is the raft deflated, folded, and strapped to the tanks used for the automatic inflation system. The bottom left photo are some of the items packed in the raft, such as a flashlight, sea anchor, air pump, oars, and a bailing bag. Although difficult to identify, the bottom right photo is one of the water activated lights on board the raft.
pre-packed ditch kits for inland seas are located behind the helm in the wheel box. The kits are prepared and maintained regularly so they are ready for use. Trying to locate a person in the water after losing sight can be difficult to nearly impossible, especially if the sea state or waves are anything bigger than a human head in the water. This is why we try to mark the spot as close as possible to the person who went over the side. We can use the GPS to mark the spot, but also we can throw life rings, life jackets, and anything else that floats into the water. Leaving a big spot of floaties in the water makes for a highly visible target to return to. Not to mention, throwing the flotation devices gives the victim plenty of things to keep them afloat and higher out of the water, thus minimizing exposure. On board Inland Seas, we have practiced recovery with a rescue boat and without. If the conditions are such that we cannot launch a rescue boat, we have to be prepared to recover the person in the water using Inland Seas. For that purpose, we would most likely use a life sling, which can be seen hoisting the dummy in the photo on the right. These are the general instructions for recovering a person in the water using the life sling. The instructions are printed on the respective container. The number one objective during a man overboard emergency is to recover the person. Once safely recovered, other issues can be attended to.
If you have fallen over the side of a vessel, these are the best positions to try to maintain while awaiting recovery. If you are to ever fall overboard without a life vest, there's a little trick you can do to keep yourself afloat. It's a tried and true method and has actually saved some lives. You may have to cut and paste the link in order to watch the video. This is a chart with a respective graph that can give you some idea as to how serious a situation can be when someone falls into the water. For most of our sailing season, the water temp is in the 40 to 50 degree range and less when it's early spring. Only for the months of July and August are the temps above that range. How high above that range is dependent on the heat of the summer. Mid Lake Michigan rarely exceeds 60s in the midsummer. Something that I would like to add if it is not already known. In the event of a medical emergency, I would advise asking the other crew and passengers if anyone has advanced medical training. There may be a nurse or doctor who could provide better care and help with the victim until advanced medical help arrives. Chances are the person will notify you in the event of a medical emergency that they are a medical professional. The medical kit aboard Inland Seas is located near the overhead, just starboard side of the main hatch. The AED for Inland Seas is located opposite the first aid kit, near the overhead, just port side of the main hatch. Most CPR first aid courses cover AED training. However, they are very simple to use and the machine literally talks you through the process. Also, as a bystander who is helping the victim, do not worry about receiving a harmful shock from the device. It is designed to not send a pulse if it detects contact from another person. More importantly, there is a greater danger that the victim will not receive a needed shock because of someone touching the victim, causing the device to misread the victim's state. If you were to receive a shock by some rare circumstance, it may get your attention. However, it will not do any significant harm. Use the AED and follow the instructions if needed. Heavy weather preparations would entail the following. Perform additional stowage, lashings, and other precautions. Make sure nothing can come loose above and below decks before the conditions set in. Double check watertight integrity of the vessel. Make sure weather boards are in, skylights are closed, and dog down hatches are secure. Make sure safety equipment is in good working order and make sure everything is stowed in its proper place. Run jack lines and have crew and harnesses if working on deck. This is to minimize the risk of crew or personnel going over the side. Reef sail if necessary. 
This is making sure the sail area is smaller given the conditions. If sailing, we want to make sure that the sail area is appropriate. Make some personal preparations as well. Make sure you're hydrated and that you've had enough to drink. Make sure your nourishment is up. You've had enough to eat. Make sure you're well rested. And beforehand, ready any gear that you might think you'd need, such as Fowley's warm clothes or snacks. Make sure your personal state is ready and you've done all you can to maintain good spirits. A lot of your ability is based on your mental state. Preparing for heavy weather doesn't necessarily mean we are going out to encounter those hair-raising conditions seen on the previous slides. It may be we're going out into conditions that are good for some fun, sporty sailing, and we want to make sure we're minimizing the risk as much as possible.